So we have already discussed when we talked about log-based recovery for the first time that these logs are needed in order to make sure that we can redo information for those transactions which successfully committed and undo information from those that did not successfully commit before the crash happened. Now, of course, there should be rules according to which we are creating these logs and not only creating the logs, but also writing the logs to persistent storage because it's, it's an essential requirement that these log informations are also present after the crash happened. The first principle here is called write ahead log principle. And it's very simple, but very important. It says the following. Before a modified page can be written back to disk, all log entries that relate to this page have to be written in the log file and log archive. That means have to be persistently and durably stored. In this case, or in these cases here, anyway, we disregard a little bit the log archive and mainly focus on log file, but it's clear that if we look at also media failures, so the hard disk can die, then we also would require a log archive. So this is like taking care of this, but for the sake of our lecture now, we will only look at the log file primarily. Okay, this is like important. So why is this important? So let's assume we have our buffer in memory and our disk. And let's assume there's one page here. Let's, let's call that page A. And there's a modification to this page because there is an entry here, which is changed from A to A plus one. So inside this page. Now let's assume that this page gets now written to disk because of some, yeah, the buffer is full and this page gets replaced since we're allowing steel in our configuration. This can happen as you know. And now this means that this page is now copied here and has the changed value. Let's say just call it for brevity A prime, which was A plus one. So now this is now in the disk content. And if the crash happened and this one here disappears because it's in memory and we see here, we have the updated value of A on disk. But if the transaction did not commit yet, well, we have to make this change undone. So we have to revert A prime back to A. And uh, well, but first of all, how do we know that A was changed? And the point is we don't know it unless we take care about to write log entries to persistent storage, which is like there after the crash, that describe what we did with A. So if we have on disk or in archive our log file, and here we have written that a transaction, let's say transaction one, was modifying our page PA and did A is A plus one to it, then we know that this page was changed and if t1 is a loser transaction so was not yet done when the crash happened then we know that we have to go here to this page pa and make the change from a to prime to a so we have to revert this the information how to undo this change is also stored here in our log with in the part that we call undo information in this case it would be a is a minus one. If we're adding one for the information here, so the operation we intended to do, then here we have the undo information. This is like kind of how the log looks like. We have seen already in some example earlier a sample log, and we will also look in more detail how this is constructed. Now, this is like the write ahead log principle, and there's in addition also the force log at commit rule. Remember that we did not configure our system with force equals to true. That means we are not forcing that the modified pages of a transactions are of a transaction are immediately written back to the file, which can happen. Or with the situation that can happen then is let's clean it up a bit. So we have we have our buffer and our database and now there is like a transaction that was making a change again we have page a let's say and we made a change let's say again a is a plus one and now the transaction commits 
And since we don't forcing this change written to disk, it could, could look like this, right? So there's still like the old page here, page A on disk, and the change is not reflected there. So A would be still the old A, not A prime, right? And now the user who gets the commit from the database promised will assume that now the change, so A to A prime, is permanently stored. Unfortunately, if now the system crashes and we're looking at the database content after the crash and it still has the old value A, there's no way we can construct A prime out of A if we don't know what the transaction was doing. Now, the force locket commit rule is solving this problem because it says before you're promising a successful commit to the application or the user, which is behind the transaction, all log entries that belong to this transaction have to be written to persistent storage. In this case, it is applies. We have our log file or log archive here. And here we say, let's say transaction two, in this case, try to modify page A and intended to add one to A. And here's also the undo information. A minus one. So now when we looking at this entry of our log and we know that T2 got promised a commit, we know that T2 is a, a winner transaction, how we say, and we have to make sure that all the changes done by, TA, by T2 are also reflected in our database on disk. And we look here and see, oh, that's the old value. So we have to add one to it and then um, the changes by this committed transaction are reflected. Now there's of course a few obstacles we have to solve. For instance, it could happen that during the recovery process, the system crashes again. And then of course we want to avoid that we're coming again here and adding again a one. So we have to keep track to see with information added to these pages on disk if the information described in this log entry have been already applied or not. Overall, we can illustrate this procedure of logging next to the normal operation of our database system as follows. We have different applications here talking to the database. And we have, of course, the database contents or the data, the tuples, and our index structures here on the disk. We also have a log file on disk. And then we have also the two archives that we don't really consider now in this lecture. We have our database buffer that we know very well from previous lectures. And we have also in addition to the log file, also a log buffer. And well, log buffer can be illustrated as a ring buffer. So you're always inserting here the latest entries. These entries are enumerated. We will call that log sequence numbers. So they're starting from one or some smaller value and they always keep on increasing. And at some point we are writing sequentially the contents of this ring buffer following this order of log sequence numbers to the file and to the archive. Now it's a bit um, too easy to say we keep on writing continuously the uh, contents here, like in this case we are starting or we're currently here writing and then the whole thing will rotate and you know, I mean, it's a ring buffer, it's not so difficult to see hopefully. But one thing we have to make sure of is that the write ahead log principle and the commit rule are followed. So what does it mean? Well, let's say there's a transaction T2 and the latest log entry for this transaction was um, log sequence number 35. And if T2 now is committing and uh, we see 35 was the latest log entry for this transaction, so 35 is here. And this means according to the commit rule, we have to now, before we tell the user commit is, is okay, we have to write all of these entries up to including 35 to our log file and archive. And for our write ahead logging, it's the same principle. If we have to evict the page from the buffer and the last modification to this page was um, locked in the log entry corresponding to log sequence number, let's say 40, and then 
our write ahead logging principle says before we can evict the page from buffer and write it to disk, we have to write all of these entries here up to including um, log sequence number 40 entry to our persistent log on file and archive. So now what kind of information do we store in our log file? In the easiest case, or in presumably easiest case, for illustration purpose, that's always easy, but this is not the way you're doing it in the end, but let's come to this later. The um, most obvious thing, which are also used in illustrations, is doing logical redo and undo information. So we would write that we intended to add 10 to A. And how do we undo this? Well, we subtract 10 from A. Instead of writing these information that we call redo and undo like this in a logical way into our log. We can also write how A looked like or how the page looked like that contains A in case of page logging in terms of byte sequences. Here we have entry logging which only looks at A and here we have page logging which would look at the entire page and we would write down images that would be the full sequence of bytes behind the page or the record. Instead of this wasteful writing of too many bytes in our log, which makes it growing very large, we can also log transitions, so deltas between the old or the old version and the new version, which would be corresponding old version and new version, of course. And of course, how to, how to do that to make an undo here, how to come back from the old version, from the, from the new version to the old version, in case we need to do undo. There's also like a compromise between the two, which is called physiological logging, which is like a logical logging regarding the operations that would move entries within a page. But then for the individual contents, we would do physical byte oriented logging. When we talk about locking images, we mean really physical like byte sequences, the contents of the pages or parts of the pages, the individual records. And in this case of images, we have a before and after image, which are just byte arrays, uh, which are re uh, well representing the image before the operation was executed and after the, ex the operation was executed. In the simplest case of page logging, it means that the the uh, log file can grow very large because we are replicating the contents of these pages for every log entry within our log. So that means it can really be very large and causing also a lot of IO effort because we have to do the logging in parallel to the normal operation of the database system. More efficiently it is to log only the before and after images of the individual entries within a page or as you will see, look at changes to or to deltas between the old and the new version. This is called transition logging. So you want to reduce the log size and you're only storing differences. That means the undo operation can use this delta to reconstruct the original state of the page or record and redo likewise can come to the new state by applying this diff. In this difference logging, XOR is used on these byte sequences. And if um, you're applying this for a whole page, and then you have, of course, um, many zeros there because many places or many positions within the page do not change. So you can compress these zeros efficiently. And um, this, this holds the same also if you do the, this difference logging on a record level, not a page, record, page level. And here you only see kind of boring, but still um, how you're doing this. If you have a normal operation here, which is changing a page A, so you have um, A1 first, and then you're changing this to A2, and then the other operation changes again from A2 to A3. So you're keeping in the state logging, you're keeping the before and after images for each of these operations. And then when you redo, you can simply take the after image, so A2, and replace A1 
by this A2 and the same of course also taking the after image A3 and you're placing A2 with. For undo the other way around, so you're replacing A3 by A2 and A2 by A1. So this is like this how it works. And for difference logging, well you're just logging these deltas, the XOR differences, and you can redo by just applying with XOR these um, differences in the same way also the other way around if you're undoing. Instead, logical logging, like I did in the illustrations to make it more visual or more apparent for you, you write down the operation you applied, including parameters perhaps that were, that were required for this uh, operation. In this case, of course, we have here simply a sum, which looks very simple, but it can be, of course, also more complicated. The problem here is with logical logging that you require a consistent state of the database in order to have this operation being applicable. So if you have some broken data records on the disk, which could happen, for instance, if you have update in place, then this logical logging um, can be not applicable in some places. And if you're doing this, then of course you have to also execute these operations which are logged. And here is a simple sum. But you can imagine that if it's not some, such a simple sum, but more complicated, this takes more time than copying only bytes or doing XOR. There's a hybrid approach, which is called physiological logging, I mentioned earlier, where you record the log entries, or you're recording these changes made to the contents of the page or the record physically, so by, uh, using byte sequences, but modification like moving a record within the page are logical. 